morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed the earlier part of the morning. This is the session on machine reading and comprehension. And the way that we are going to format this session is we'll have four talks, each of which will be about 12 minutes, or I might, and followed by a very brief moment of questions. And then we'll have a longer panel discussion, which we're going to try to position as a hallway conversation that you are participants in and observers of. So later on, when we're having our hallway conversation up here, if you want to join in and ask a question or make an observation from your own experience, please then we'll have mics available for you to join. So that's the format, about you know, half talks and then half panel discussion. Again, the topic is machine reading and comprehension. Our first speaker is Percy Liang, who in one way needs very little introduction, but just for the sake of giving the introduction. Uh, Percy is an assistant professor of computer science at Stanford University. His research interests include modeling natural language semantics and developing machine learning methods to infer rich latent structures using very limited supervision. Among his many awards, I'll just point out that Percy was the recipient of the Microsoft Research Faculty Fellowship in 2014. And I think he's done, gone on to do fabulous things with that. So thank you very much, Percy. Okay. Let's see, my clicker. All right, thanks uh, Lucy for inviting me and thanks everyone for being here. I'm really happy to be able to share some of my thoughts on uh, question and answering. So when I was in grad school, I s spent a lot of time thinking about how to design kind of more clever models and algorithms. And I think as uh, time uh, went on, I kind of began to realize the kind of the importance of you know, data sets. And um, as you can see in a lot of different other areas, uh, of, of AI, data sets are kind of a primary uh, driver of a lot of the progress from switchboard and speech recognition, ImageNet and object recognition, all the parallel text you have on the web for machine translation and human games and self-play and AlphaGo. So what about kind of question answering? What is the state of affairs? This is something that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, so over the last five years, I've kind of spend a lot of time thinking about what uh, data sets should look like and I kind of want to share some of the um, lessons that we learned. Um, and in the back of my mind was this kind of idea that we wanted data sets that couldn't be solved by um, quote cheap tricks. So you really had to solve the problem to do well on these data sets. Um, so th from this perspective I think the idea of semantic parsing was a very um, kind of uh, attractive where you had to take sentences and kind of convert them, break them down into pieces, combine them into these logical forms and kind of execute them to um, get the answer. So in that paradigm, we started kind of building uh, the f first days in 2013 with Jonathan Barant and others on um, web questions. Um, what I really liked about this data set is that we actually took a real kind of user queries from a search engine, so the questions were kind of um, a realistic, uh, you know, uh, came from a realistic distribution. But on the other hand, be, this realism also caught up with us because we found quickly that most of the questions couldn't actually be answered by the structured knowledge base, even though it was you know, quite large. That resulted, we, start, we wanted to get, you know, oops, sorry about that. Um, time to take a break. Uh, we started with 100,000 questions, but we whittled it down to um, only six because of um, how much mismatch between questions and the knowledge base there was. So it ended up getting becoming kind of a noisy data set, and there wasn't that much kind of compositionality. Um, so two years later, we start, created another data set called We Could Table Questions, and here the idea was to get a much cleaner and compositional data set. So you had a questions like, in what city did Peter's last first place finish occur? And you had this table, which you were meant to look at and um, try to reason about to answer the question. So in this particular example, you might look at the position column, select the first rows, um, select, select the last one, select the row, and then uh, report the venue. So this is kind of something that requires a bit more reasoning on this kind of uh, structured um, object. So, 
Um, the nice thing was it was compositional. It was clean. It was kind of we gave up kind of on the the realism um, and made sure that it was clean. And I think there's still quite a bit of mileage left. Um, the ceiling is kind of uh, around 90 percent, but the state of art is only kind of 45 percent. But maybe um, maybe the data set is actually a little bit too. Uh, small and maybe maybe it's too hard. It's, it's too small given its uh, complexity, and we've also found that it was a little bit kind of niche these, having these tables. So um, then we moved on to th uh, developing our uh, new data set. Uh, it's called Squad for reading comprehension, and the task is very straightforward. Take a, a passage out, a paragraph out of Wikipedia, and answer natural language questions on it, like what causes precipitation to fall, gravity, and and so on. And here we kind of gave up on realism um, and also on um, you know really trying hard to make it uh, a difficult task and just say okay let's just get a large and clean data set and see where that goes. So we gather 100k examples, which at the time um, I guess at the time was only a year ago, but it was you know much larger than many of the other uh, data sets uh, of kind of um, for question answering, reading comprehension. Um, and we ended up with questions which were, you know, interesting, but you know, they weren't, you know, super complicated. Um, um, so I think about it uh, kind of retrospectively as kind of a necessary but not sufficient data set. Any system that claims to do reading comprehension should just nail this, but it's not enough to, uh, just to nail this. Um, we also did something um, which I think was. Uh, quite useful is that um, we built a uh, platform separately called CodaLab uh, to allow people to submit code and run uh, reproducible experiments. We use this platform to say that in order to participate and report test results on the uh, squad data set, you had to submit your code. And this actually led to you know, a leaderboard with a full of models which were you know, publicly available. So more on that in a little bit. So what's the status? So in, over a, uh, in a little bit over a year, there's been 30 different teams um, submitting to this, um, uh, the leaderboard. The best system is now, I guess this is MSRA, 84.7% uh, F1, and human ceiling is around 91. Okay, so um, when we submitted this, this we had like some logistic regression baseline which got 50, and we we're wondering like, hmm, how long would it take um, to for uh, to basically kind of nail it. They said this is uh, definitely faster than I expected. I knew that it was not meant to be an especially difficult data set, but I guess um, once you have a data set and a community goes at it, progress is made pretty quickly. And I think there were also a lot of interesting ideas that came out of it, in particular all these kind of new uh, sophisticated attention mechanisms, um, which I think is a, uh, one of the, you know, by, I mean, the, the kind of principal value of having a data set is that it drives kind of new types of uh, models. Um, I'll just mention a bunch of other data sets. There's ones which are based on kind of fill in the blank, which has an advantage of being able to um, get a lot more data uh, past 100K. Um, there's a question answering, which actually does require reasoning, but they're kind of small. There's four data sets, um, two of which actually just came out, I think, uh, last month or so. Um, and use uh, trivia QA and Quasar. So these are kind of more in the spirit of uh, you know, a squad kind of reading comprehension. Memes Marco, um, you'll hear a lot more about later, so I'm not going to say much about it. Um, so now the, I guess the question is, are these you know, data sets uh, enough to make kind of meaningful progress on you know, reading comprehension? So we decided to um, look a little bit deeper. And we took, a, one, here's an example passage from Squad, and here's a question. What is the name of the quarterback who was 38 in Super Bowl uh, 33? And if you look at the question, it's, you, it's multi-sentence reasoning. You have to do a little bit of um, kind of, yeah, a little bit of reasoning to answer this. And BIDAF, which is this model from UW, actually gets this right. So you could conclude, wow, this is, you know, this is pretty good. Um, then we decided to have some fun, and we um, inserted this sentence at the end. So Jeff Dean is the name of the quarterback who was 37 in Champ Bowl uh, 34. Okay, and what is BIDAF uh, output? Jeff Dean. Okay, so, um, you know, and no human would uh, kind of, unless they're not really paying attention, would um, make this error. So, um, 
you know, we did this more systematically. So we took all the test set questions, we um, you know, mutated them by you know switching named entities and you know replacing words with their antonyms. We generated the fake answer. We converted it into a declarative statement, and then you know this process is a little bit noisy. So we had crowd workers fix up the uh, the question. So in the end, the adversary would add a sentence to the end of the passage in hopes of having high word overlap with the question, but really not answering the question at all. And um, so here's the results. So this is uh, one of the advantages of having everyone's uh, code uh, submitted in uh, on Coder Lab is that you can just run all the models. So we ran all these models on this uh, new kind of adversarial evaluation, and the uh, numbers uh, start less looking less good. Um, so you know, basically going from 80s and mid 70s to more like 50s and 40s. Um, so note that humans, on the other hand, uh, do not. Um, get fooled very much at all. One other thing that's kind of interesting is that you notice that some of the order ranking has also um, you know, reversed. So ReasonNet was number one, and now it's uh, no longer number one. It's actually seven points behind um, mnemonic, mnemonic uh, uh, net, um, which is uh, doing a, you know, 56 isn't great, but it's, uh, it's better than you know, 50. So um, I think there's much more to be said on this, but in the interest of time, I'll move on. Um, so you could ask, OK, well, you generate these um, adversarial examples, and really, this is not fair, because you should have trained. I mean, this is the training set and the test set are different distributions. So why don't you just train on these? So we did train on these, and it does fix the problem. So accuracy only drops from on one of the models, 74 to 70. But now. And the new adversary comes in, and instead of appending the sentence, it prepends them, and now again, you're down to 36. And I mean, this is kind of a, you know, this is kind of where you get to kind of an arms race. There's a, you know, no matter what kind of um, adversary you uh, you guard against, there's always going to be something else uh, that could, you know, bring your accuracy down. So the way to think about this is really about evaluation. Yes, you could go and add these examples to your training set and guard against them. But really, they should be um, hold out um, to kind of really test whether a model has understood. It's the same reason that you don't train on your test set to get better test numbers. Um, um, so, so more generally, we've been thinking about you know, how do we move past this kind of uh, just pure data set of paradigm where you gather, train, and test, and you measure average accuracy to really kind of get a more rigorous notion of whether models are actually understanding. So here's one possible generalization, which is the idea of testing and properties. So what we saw was that models should be invariant under adding distracting sentences. So you take a test example, you add some distracting sentences. Um, these are new examples which the model should get right. Um, but there's other ones. So you, the model should also be invariant under paraphrase. If you paraphrase a sentence, it should also get not, not get fooled. If you replace uh, you know, entities like the answer John Elway with you know, Barack Obama or whoever, uh, you should actually um, return that entity as well. And we found in our experience, actually, these kind of obvious properties do not hold, especially of these kind of very um, you know, complex neural models, which are kind of fitting all sorts of you know statistical correlations, they actually don't kind of behave kind of predictably as you might hope. Um, and these, uh, the idea of these property testing ideas is that they would kind of expose these um, these weaknesses. And currently, we're kind of investigating kind of wider space of adversaries because we're not going to you know say okay, append sentence, prepend, you know, um, and you'd be able to enumerate. So we're kind of using crowdsourcing to try to do that. Um, one thing to kind of uh, idea that I think is interesting is that you know once you um, you know the idea of an adversary is uh, um, the same as a teacher. Only the adversary is uh, at test time and the teacher is kind of at training time. Okay, so with that, I'll uh, wrap up. So one of the things that hopefully we'll discuss a little bit more is this trade-off between having a clean data set and a uh, kind of a realistic data set. When you have a realistic data set, there's all sorts of noise that make it kind of really hard to measure kind of uh, sometimes meaningful progress. Um, and in terms of you know, what data set should we be uh, you know, looking at now, I think of data sets as really kind of you know, a progression. Um, you know, and 
every for every time and uh, place there is should be a data set that kind of gets at the cusp of you know what is you know currently solvable and I think managing data sets difficulty not too hard not too easy I think is an important thing if it's going to actually meaningfully push uh, forward progress. And then I think this idea of stronger testing of models based on adversaries and properties, I think could be a really interesting um, thing to, to explore, um, which will move us away from this kind of the, the vanilla train and test uh, uh, learning paradigms in machine learning. OK, so with that, thank the collaborators and uh, uh, funding agencies to questions. Taking questions? Yeah, taking yeah. questions. Yeah. So I very much sympathize with this notion of, of having invariance that you know your learner should be respect, uh, robust with respect to maybe even, even crowdsourcing them and so on. Mm -hmm. But if we have such a set of invariance, why not actually encode it not in the test data, not even in the train data, but in the model itself as a priori knowledge? I know that this model will have these invariants no matter what the gradient descent does, and then the job is done. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. But I think you should think about invariants as the same role of, as examples, uh, in the sense that there should be things that are uh, training and things that are be test. I sh um, it's, if you have desired invariants, you should encode them. But um, there's always going to be kind of other types of invariances, which um, you hopefully should be kind of implied. Maybe it should be able to, able to generalize uh, across different types of invariances. And that's the argument for t train tests. But. OK, thank you very much, Percy. Okay. And uh, hold your questions, write them down, because there will be opportunity during our panel discussion to continue asking in our speakers the questions. Um, so now, let me get my sheet sheet. The next speaker will be Jianfeng Gao. Um, Jianfeng is the research manager in Microsoft AI and Research Group. He's worked on deep learning from text and image processing, and he leads the development of the AI systems for the machine reading comprehension question generation, question answering, dialogue, and business applications. I've known Jen Feng for a long time because he was a principal researcher in the Natural Language Processing Group, where he worked on many things, among which web search, query understanding, and especially statistical machine translation. Um, previously, he was at MSRA, or not MSRA, what, yes. what does it say, MSRA, and worked on in Chinese input method editors and was part of the group that developed the first, first Chinese speech recognition system. So Jianfeng has a long history, and uh, <laughs> my pleasure to present. Uh, OK, uh, as Lucy said, I have a long history. Uh, as I'm getting older, I'm more interested in history. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, the current standards, and at the same time, I'm going to review the history. Uh, here's the outline of my talk and uh, Rangan's. I'm going to talk about the first two bullets, and Rangan going to talk about the MS Marco. Uh, first of all, we're going to review uh, some history. Okay. Symbolic approach to question answering. In that case, I'm going to use MSR uh, MyNet as a, as a case study. And uh, then uh, we back to the uh, to the current stage, and we talk about new approaches to uh, machine reading comprehension and question answering. Uh, I think back to early '80s, people start to develop systems called uh, product systems, and they believe at that time this is a system that which can mimic human brain. There are two purposes of developing such system. First is to simulate how human brain works so that uh, they can understand how the mind uh, is formed and how the mind works. Although you cannot open the human brain, but you can open uh, the simulated system. But later on, people figured out, oh, even without complete understanding how human brain works, we can still make the system very, very useful to solve realistic tasks. 
Now the system consists of three components. First is the production rules, uh, which are essentially condition action pairs. If it's like an if then statement, and uh, at this time people believe that the word knowledge can be represented using a graph, which consists of uh, millions and billions of production rules. Uh, we are still doing this today, and uh, that's the first piece. It's like a uh, uh, brain. You have a long-term memory. You remember all the knowledge about the world. Second piece is working uh, memory. Uh, this is task-specific. Let's say if you are given a question, you want to form an answer, then you trigger your work memory, working memory by leveraging useful and relevant in information until you can generate the answer in your memory. So that's the short-term memory part, uh, which is also represented as a state vector, hidden state vector in the modern uh, recurrent neural network. And the third part is the controller. This is the, can be viewed as a reasoning engine, okay? How it works. Um, back to 1993, I think, before I, uh, I was there at the school. I joined Microsoft in two, year 2000. So this is slides from my uh, manager, Bill Dolan. Okay. At that time, uh, we tried, or they actually, they tried to pass large amounts of test data uh, from dictionaries and later on from webs by identifying entities and the relationships among entities to create a giant knowledge graph like this. We believe this can represent all knowledge world, or all world knowledge. And with that graph, we call this MyNet. Okay? With that graph, we can do a lot of things. One of them is question answering. So you ask a question. I can find the answer in the graph. How it works? It works just like the production system I showed earlier. Given an input query, I say, who assessed the Abraham Lincoln? We first use the parser to turn this query into a so-called logic form, which is a graphical representation of the input query. Remember, the MyNet itself is like a big graph. Right? This is a big graph. So we just show the question graph into the big graph to see if it can stick. Okay? If it stick there, then the corresponding text could be used as a source to generate the answer. Then we generate the answer. This works beautifully. Amazingly, a lot of times, you can generate the answer using the sentences that are not in the original corpus. I think Bill and uh, Team Lucy and other people, they demonstrated to Bill Gates right, 20 years ago. And Bill got super excited. Said, OK, make the real. Build a product out of it. Because it works so beautifully. And later on, we found just not very often. Then we do a test. We did a test against uh, Inkata. Do you remember Inkata? If you remember Inkata, you're as old as me. Okay. Inkata. Then we found that most of the time, the approach failed to produce any answer at all, even when an exact answer was in the corpus. And the linguistic analysis, for example, the parser, worked perfectly. And what went wrong? One well, major issue is paraphrasing, or what we call semantic reasoning. Remember, there's a, a key difference between similar words and a similar concept. For example, there are different ways, tons of different ways of saying how long a river is. Right? There are different ways. There are more and more. How long? Uh, it's almost impossible for any symbolic approach to capture all these variations and map them to the same concept of representation. So in a sense, we hit a wall uh, in terms of performance by approaching it that way. Now back to today. 20 years later, yeah, after I joined Microsoft, yeah, 20 years later, I think we are still far from understanding, but we've made great progress. For example, we have big data, we have bad hardwares, 
and most of all, we have better algorithm, especially the neural networks, deep learning, reinforcement learning. But look back, actually we st still stick to the same principle. You should know a word by the company it keeps. Now, these slides show the key difference between a symbolic approach and the so-called neural approach. On the left hand, it's a symbolic space, where the knowledge is represented uh, using uh, words, relations, templates, using high-dimensional discrete space vectors, uh, sparse vectors. And the nice thing about this uh, symbolic space is everything is comprehensible, because people can read it. Know how the knowledge, how the knowledge is encoded, but the problem is, it's not scalable. It's not robust to any paraphrasing variations, paraphrase variations. So I would say, on this space, it's a human friendly but not computational uh, friendly. On the other side, it's a neural space, where we represent the knowledge using vectors, matrices. Uh, uh, they are just numbers which are not human comprehensible at all. But the nice thing about that is everything is continuous. And the word knowledge can be represented in a very compact way. So it's very computationally e uh, efficient. One way to combine these two space uh, is the mission of the neural machine, uh, neural machine reading comprehension models. What we do is here. We start from the symbolic space. Let's say you have a uh, query. You got a query uh, written as a text string, right? word string. Assuming that you already encode the word knowledge in the uh, neural space as matrices or, or vectors. Then you first of all map the query from symbolic space to, uh, to neural space using so-called embedding model. Then you do the okay, okay, you then do you do the inference in the symbolic uh, in the uh, neural space to generate the answer. Now the answer cannot be uh, human comprehensible until you map the back into symbolic space using generative models or decoders. These are pretty much the standard encoder decoder framework with inference. Okay. The nice thing about this is that now all these models are based on continuous functions. So if there's a training data tell you uh, what the correct answer A is respect to the input query Q, you can compute the error made by the system and through back propagation, updating all the models using an end, uh, in an end-to-end -end fashion. That's how the current model works. I'll give a quick uh, uh, I mean, okay, a uh, quick uh, update, a uh, quick overview of the reason that uh, Percy also mentioned that model previously. Uh, in the previous talk, uh, this model tried to mimic the human mind in the way that it also contains uh, the shared memory, which uh, is uh, uh, like the production rules in the old production system, to encode the task specific knowledge. It also has this walk, uh, walking memory, which we represented using uh, hidden state S, containing a description of the current state of the, word, uh, of the word in a reasoning process. And it has a controller, which is a reasoning uh, uh, component. And the nice thing about this, yeah, it also has the external memory, the M. The external memory uh, can, uh, stores all the production rules. Right? And uh, I, let me give you a quick uh, update. The, the system consists of, uh, in conceptual, consists of two parts. One is the memory, the, 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 the working memory and the, the long term memory. The other part is the reasoning engine. Let's talk about the reasoning engine using this example first. Okay. It uh, tried to mimic uh, the inference process of a human reader. For example, when you read a document, uh, when you have a question in mind and read a document, you often read the document multiple times, every time focusing on different portions of the document until a satisfying answer is formed in your brain. The reason is simply 
and follow the same process. Give example, uh, given query, read in that first, read the query, and uh, try to identify uh, useful information from the memory. The memory encode the entire passage, right, from the memory, and uh, try to use the relevant information generate the answer. Then it ask itself whether the answer is good enough or not. If the answer is no, it's not good enough, then it will update the working memory. Then based on that, it will uh, look for additional useful information in the shared memory again. Now this time, it will focus on different portions uh, of the memory so that it will for, uh, update the state in a way that more likely a satisfied answer can be generated. It do it, uh, it does it uh, iteratively, and finally it will get the answer. Finally, it will get the answer. So, uh, one property of this approach is that the number of steps and the model takes depends on the complexity of the task. It's intuitively correct, right? When you read a document to answer a question, it really depends on how difficult the document is and how challenging the question is. If it's very challenging, you need to read the document m many times. If it's question is simple, you read it once and get the answer. It mimics that process. And the other part is the memory. The long-term memory is supposed to encode the world knowledge, but we are not doing it by directly encoding the knowledge graph into the memory directly. Instead, we are doing so by performing question answering tasks. For example, we found this memory, uh, found this knowledge graph. We can identify a lot of question answer pairs. Then these question answer pairs are used as a training data for the uh, reader net. Basically, uh, you give reader net a question. Then reader net try to form an answer by leveraging useful and relevant information in, in the memory. But if you find that the information, such information is missing in the memory, then the reader net needs to learn how to seek and store new information by updating the memory by so-called uh, reinforcement learning so that it will be able to answer the question correctly next time. So it, how, this is how it works. Uh, if you take a look at what eventually encoded in the memory, then you see that the similar concepts and uh, uh, relations uh, are paired together in that uh, neural space. Okay, that's all my part. Thank you. Okay, so I'll go ahead and, and introduce Rangan right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Rangan, like 11.45. Target. So it's my pleasure to introduce Rangan to you. He's the Group Program Manager for Search and Artificial Intelligence in the Bing Division. His team uses AI techniques such as machine learning to solve customer and business problems across various products, including finding what you're looking for through Bing and answering open domain questions um, through Cortana. And he manages the search platform that runs all of the complex algorithms, including the large deep learning models, to keep Bing running. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, can you guys hear me? I think so. All right, great. Um, so Jennifer and I have been working on this machine reading comprehension space for the last couple years. And one of the things we were talking about when we were thinking about the strategy of solving this problem was, wouldn't it be great if Microsoft could donate a data set that can help the research community to uh, solve the problems that we thought were important? So that's what led to MS Marco. Um, first, just going over a little bit of the evolution of how we've seen these MRC data sets. The first couple um, were actually created by Microsoft. Um, and I think Percy had a longer list, so this is sort of a summary. But uh, the problem with the first few is that they were just too small for these data-intensive algorithms like deep learning. So uh, two of our favorites here are MCTest and WikiQA. So MCTest was a collection of children's stories, um, sort of like this, where 
some would, you know, it'd be a story about James the turtle. He was getting in trouble and doing a bunch of things. And that, uh, and then you would ask the question, you know, what is the name of the troublemaking turtle? And then you have a multiple choice uh, set of things like, you know, fries, pudding, James, Jane. And the goal was, could I um, answer these questions? So that's what MC test was. And, um, you know, it was really hard to use deep learning and technologies that you know, tend to work very well on some of these other uh, data sets like image recognition and so on. Until one, um, one startup called Maluba actually was able to do that and actually it still has the um, best score on this data set. After that, uh, there was a set of data sets that were a lot bigger. So what they decided was, well, there's a lot of really well-written uh, content out there either in um, like news stories or things like that. And what we could do is just turn them into fill in the blank questions. So this is an example of a passage. They removed the entities to try and anonymize it. And then your question, uh, sometimes this, in this example for CNN, was the question would come from the summary of that article and they would remove the entity there and your goal was to guess which entity from that uh, passage could fill that in. So the idea is if you actually are able to do reading comprehension, you should be able to fill in that summary. But then there was some analysis that showed that you can actually do pretty well on this without actually doing reading comprehension. So, um, or there's a bunch of tricks you can do to do this. So I think this goes back to what Percy was saying: is we need to create data sets that um, are untrickable. I forgot the exact phrasing he used, but um, yeah, we want to do things that really move us towards algorithms that really comprehend. The next set of data sets are these uh, span answer data sets. So Squad is uh, the most popular, but this is another one called News QA. And it looks like this. So someone would ask the question, where did Tesla live for much of his life? And there was this uh, passage which came from Wikipedia, and your goal was to pick this, pass or pick this span um, that says New York Hotels. And the way this is generated is they would take a random sample of these Wikipedia pages, and then they would ask crowdsource judges to actually ask the questions. Um, and then MS Marco was our contribution, and there's a couple of ways that this is different. I'll, I'll fully summarize um, in the next slide. But uh, the biggest differences here are uh, we don't just want people to pick a span, we want people to actually human synthesize uh, an answer, or human generate the answer. Uh, and this is an example of one of the queries that you can find in MS Marco. So the question is, will I qualify for OSAP if I'm new in Canada? And what we do is, uh, and these are, by the way, real queries that come to our search engines. We've anonymized them. And we give you a bunch of documents which could answer the question and some snippets that we thought were the most relevant for those documents. So uh, for this, uh, while I qualify for OSAP, your goal is to be able to build a model that reads these and recognizes this is probably the most important passage, which says to qualify uh, or to be eligible, you must be a Canadian citizen, permanent resident, or a protected person. Um, and then you, your model has to understand that, well, if you're uh, new in Canada, you're probably not these three things, so you should say, no, you won't qualify. So that's the, that's the goal of this task, which is um, pretty difficult. So MS Marco, what does it stand for? It stands for Microsoft Machine Reading Comprehension Dataset. Um, what's unique about it is uh, they're real world questions. So you know that these are real things that people are asking and they actually want to know about. These are real world documents. So it's not just these clean uh, edited doc documents like um, uh, things that you could find in news sources or even in Wikipedia, but these are like real, um, the answers can be from blogs, they can be from um, you know, a lot of uh, content out there. Some of it actually could be adversarial as well. Um, and then some questions are unanswerable, so a lot of people ask questions that don't have an answer, nobody's actually answered it. And the goal for your model is actually not just to pick the best, the most likely answer, but also to tell that, you know what, I can't answer this. So we think that's a pretty important part of uh, comprehension. And then some of the answers also need some inference. So um, the biggest chunk of in inference answers are these uh, yes, no answers, or yes, no questions. Um, these are some examples. This is a really nice summary from a paper from MSRA called SNET. Uh, and you can see that um, these are what are called um, these are the synthesis examples they pulled out that you know, go beyond just you know, picking a span. So uh, the first is you might need to just refine this snippet. So if the question is, you know, what are different types of skin ulcers, um, you actually have to remove these numbers and just say, look, it's um, 
So I think this person says, I'm going to remove the numbers and say this is what the answer is. Um, the other one is you want to combine evidence uh, with question words. So sometimes uh, we, we actually have the user, or actually have the crowdsource judge write a full sentence. So if someone says, what is the economic impact of Japan earthquake, you have to actually use some of the words from the question in your answer. Um, the third type of thing you'll see is multiple evidence from one passage. This is a pretty good, good one, which is, uh, what is the time span of Roman Empire? And you know, the answer is 27 BC to 47 AD. So you get this span and this span uh, in order to answer it. Um, sometimes evidence is across multiple passages. So you know, who did Odysseus see in the underworld? Uh, there's one thing talking about Achilles, another one about um, Elphinor. Um, and then finally, this is the inference example. Is there an age limit for learning speech? Uh, you're supposed to read all this and say no. Right? And this is sort of the distribution of it. So we've got uh, most of it is uh, these exact matches, which is kind of like span answers. Uh, then we also have this refining the evidence snippet is about 20%. Um, combining question works is about 2%. Multiple evidence is about uh, 3 to 4 percent, and inference is about 4.5 uh, percent. So um, our ultimate goal of why we're building this data set um, is to create a, an agent that you can actually ask a question. It would then just go read the entire web or everything written, and then reason over it, and then summarize the answer, which is what motivated us to write these um, you know, human-generated sentences near the end. So um, summary, do you want to <laughs> give this? OK. Um, well, I, I guess you don't need to summarize that much. You just talked about it like 10 minutes ago. Um, but yeah, there's been symbolic approaches to QA. It hasn't really worked that well. Um, now we're trying these neural approaches to uh, QA, which is doing much better. Um, then we have a set of ongoing research. So we're very excited about all the data sets out there. Um, Emma Samarco is our contribution. Um, we are working on how do we get these neural models to do reasoning as well. So some of the nice things you get from symbolic reasoning, how do we get them um, how do we get neural models to do that? Um, and then finally, how do we interpret and understand these models? That's also very important. So are there any questions for Rangan and Jiang right now before we start with the last presentation? And again, you can hold your questions for the panel discussion. OK. Um, I just wanted to personally thank Jia Feng for a beautiful summarization of the previous work that I had been involved with, with <laughs> MS MindNet. You did it beautifully. <laughs> um, and we did hit a wall. And it compelled us to work on paraphrase pretty much single-mindedly for the next 10 years. So it's, it's wonderful to see that that wall is starting to be climbed now. Um, so let me uh, now introduce Isabel. Um, Augenstein? Augenstein? Augenstein, sorry. So Isabel is now a tenure track, pro track profess assistant professor in computer science at the University of Copenhagen. She's just recently moved from the University College in London. Um, her main research interests are weekly supervised and low resource learning with applications including information extraction, automated fact checking, and machine reading from scientific articles. And that's what she'll be focusing on today. She organizes uh, an, a variety of shared tasks on information extraction um, and is also involved very much in the organization of very interesting workshops. Uh, the first uh, women in NLP workshop at ACL, workshops on deep structured prediction at ICML, and we'll hear about her work on scientific publications. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice introduction and also, oh, I don't think this is on. Hello? Is it on? Okay. Yeah, it sounds like uh, I can't really hear myself very loudly, sorry. Uh, well, thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me in general. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, fact checking and machine reading of scientific publications. So far, you've mostly heard about uh, question answering tasks. So um, the idea of fact checking is that we have a statement, for example, unemployment in the US is 42%, and we want to know is this statement true or false based on some background evidence. We can pose this either in statement form, in statement form in some uh, logical representation, um, or we can also pose it as a question, asking what is the stance of Hillary Clinton on immigration, and then it can be a multiple choice question, answer, question answering uh, task. Okay. 
Um, the other task I'm interested in is understanding scientific publications where we have uh, very long documents, papers, and we want to know things about what methods and tasks and data sets they use. We might want to ask questions about them, such as what models exist for, que exist for question answering, or we might have a statement we want to ver verify, such as method A outperforms method B for task C. Now I'll give you a brief overview of what my view on, quest uh, oh, sorry, on machine reading is and how I think an ideal machine reading scenario would look like. So the first thing we have are questions. Um, the, the next thing we have that most people kind of ignore is um, evidence. And in order to answer questions, we need to retrieve evidence. And the evidence can come from articles, it can come from social media, or it can come from knowledge bases. Then based on the questions and the evidence, the machine reading model needs to learn to represent questions and evidence in order to make sense of the information and later on return the correct answer. So. Um, the representations I usually work with are neural representations, but um, as we've already heard about earlier, uh, back in the days, uh, symbolic representations um, were also widely used, and there are people working on the intersection of those things. Okay. So in terms of the representations, people in, in natural language processing, they usually work with sequence representation methods such as RNNs and variants thereof. But it's also common to use cheaper methods uh, where we just uh, encode words and then average representations of words or even just view phrases as one token. So method for task could just be one phrase and one, uh, one token. So then finally, based on the query and the retrieved evidence and the representations, we return an answer. And the answer can either be an explanation, such as methods based on RNNs are widely used, or it can just be a, a short string like RNNs. Um, right. So this is kind of my idealized way of looking at machine reading. And as I already said, uh, people normally don't really look at machine reading this way. They don't really integrate the information retrieval step. Usually they just look at one document, they do machine comprehension of one document, for example. And uh, moreover, they usually look at component tasks. So there are plenty of people only looking at representation learning of uh, words, for example. And this can be a good or a bad thing, and we'll discuss this some more later. <laughs> so the way I've looked at uh, fact-checking is as a stance detection problem. And the machine reading problem we want to solve here is we want to learn how two sequences of words, um, two sentences or, or paragraphs, relate to one another. In the fake news challenge setup, we had a, a headline of an article and then a paragraph. And we wanted to know, um, does the document uh, confirm or, or deny or is it unrelated or uh, some, other, um, uh, some other possible answers uh, to the uh, headline. And there are several problems with this. So uh, one problem is that the interpretation, of course, depends on the, on the headline. So if we exchange the headline, then the answer will be different. And this is a problem at test time where we have lots of unseen um, headlines. And then also, uh, sorry, um, the, the benefit here is that actually there's, um, there's often an overlap between the headline and the document. So we can design some methods which measure the overlap and then based on that at least say if they're related or unrelated. Another stance detection scenario I looked at is the semi stance detection scenario where uh, we had tweets and then we had very, very short targets such as legalization of abortion or atheism, pro-life and so on. And those targets in theory should be a user given. And then again we want to know how do they relate to one another. And as before the interpretation depends on the target um, and the target is not always mentioned in, this, uh, in the tweet, 
which is which is a very big problem. So we, if we see a fetus has rights too, we need to somehow learn that fetus relates to abortion, to atheism, uh, to pro-life without without having seen that um, necessarily. So um, the approaches we worked at here were kind of domain adaptation and weak uh, supervision approaches in order to solve that. Okay, now briefly about scientific paper understanding. So one task we worked on is a scientific paper summarization, where we have a long paper and we want to summarize it in an extractive way, meaning we could take a text marker and just mark bits of the document and lift those out as, uh, as a summary. And we viewed it as a binary classification task, um, meaning each sentence could be a summary uh, sentence or not. And, then, and there are lots of people working on uh, abstractive summarization, which is to, um, to generate a summary. Um, usually they work, on, uh, work with short text. Um, so because we're working with very, very long documents here, we, uh, we did a fine encoding of the sentence in question and then a coarse encoding of the rest of the document. Um, and this worked very well in practice. Okay, just briefly how we, how we um, designed this data set. So we used uh, uh, papers from ScienceDirect where authors actually supply summaries. They have to uh, enter highlight statements, as I said. And these highlight statements, as we discovered, they actually copy from the main part of the text, sometimes directly and sometimes uh, they reformulate a little bit. And this is what we can use as, a, as gold standard answers then. So the, uh, the scientific uh, publication summarization uh, task is then to recreate those highlight statements. So to sum up and kind of to lead over to the discussion, I want to say some of the research challenges that we face in machine reading and also natural language processing more generally is that often, there, uh, often we only have uh, small data sets. It's also because there are lots of niche problems and uh, people design lots of new data sets. And um, lots of people, including myself, work on weak supervision, multitask learning, semi-supervision in order to perform well even on small data sets. Another factor that might play into this is that those neural machine reading methods are very, very costly, which means um, as a researcher with not so many resources, it takes a long time to run those experiments. So I think small data sets are actually qu kind of attractive for, for researchers, even though it makes more sense to use bigger data sets. There are also very few data sets which consider large or multiple documents as evidence documents. Um, as we've seen already, for question answering, there's been a proliferation of data sets. Uh, some use toy tasks or are not very well designed. So an example of a toy task is data sets which have very, very small vocabulary. So a very, very small uh, number of distinct words that are used. And uh, some data sets are very easy to game. So you can just design some, some easy rules in order to get a very high performance. So those data sets we don't really want to create. So I hope in the discussion we can talk a bit more about how to design good data sets. Thank you. So does anybody have a question specifically for Isabel before we move to the panel discussion? If not, then I would invite all panelists to come into our corridor, our hallway. And uh, so the way that we would like to do this is to simulate a hallway conversation. So we'll imagine that our speakers are now gathering in the hallway and they're going to talk about each other's presentations and they're going to ask each other some questions and if they don't I will ask some questions. And I would invite you in the audience to join the corridor discussion. You can sit or stand. <laughs> Ever. Um, but Might as well maybe sit. sitting is easier. Uh, I'll stand we here. Want a hallway conversation. Okay. <laughs> oh, you can stand. And I think I hear you are all mic'd up now. Um, so let me just say, like, I really enjoyed all of your presentations. I'm just curious, like, you know, in speech, 
the speech data sets mm -hmm. seem to have been around for 20 years. People are still, you know, reporting results on the same data set, the same test set that they did 20 years ago. So which of these data sets is going to be around 20 years from now? Should it be around 20 years from now? And if not, what would, should it look like? What do you think? I, I don't think your data set is going to last 20 years. I don't think so either. <laughs> Over three years, <laughs> my guess. Yeah. Okay. Three to five years, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, uh, well, there's a question of whether it will uh -huh. or whether it should. Okay. I guess um, people still might be reporting <laughs> yeah, results yeah, on no, it. Yeah, yeah, no, should not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't think any of the data sets will actually last 20 years, in my opinion. Because in speech, the situation is different. In speech, the, the, the problem is very well defined. But now we are talking about machine reading <laughs> comprehension. Yeah. Uh, the problem itself is arguable, right? What exactly is machine reading comprehension? <coughs> All the data sets we are developing nowadays uh, can be viewed as a stepping stones towards that goal, right? Uh, we know it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a grand vision, right, to have computer understand uh, natural language, but how to reach that. Yeah. Uh, the tricky part is that comprehension part, right? Yeah. Like the understanding. And I think maybe in the end it's going to take a lot of data sets to know, like, th do these models actually have understanding? You know, just like when I think about, um, you know, how we test kids reading comprehension, it's not just one type of question, we ask mm -hmm. them multiple questions. Um, and I think that's what's going to be important here too. Yeah. I think one of the other things that we also um, only discovering what our models are really, really bad at, like Percy said, if we prepend or, or put, uh, you know, append a uh, uh, sentence to just an existing text, then all of a sudden our model doesn't perform well anymore. And those are the kinds of things that we're still learning about our tasks. So um, mm -hmm. then we might have some more data sets just based on testing those kinds of problems in future. Mm -hmm. And then once we can solve that, we might need some more data sets to solve mm -hmm. some more, uh, right. yeah, some more challenging. Problems. I guess, I guess my question, one question is, is you know, we have a vision of machine reading, but what does it, like, can we, can, can we come to a crisper definition? What does it mean? Is it just the ability to answer questions, or is human comprehension more encompassing? So you mentioned about how we test children, for example. My, my current focus has been on question generation recently. Um, so one way, one pedagogical method for teaching a, a student's um, understanding of a topic is can they generate an interesting question? So, I mean, that's kind of the flip of that. So, mm. so what, is, what, are, what do we think of as the vision of machine reading? Is there a crisp definition or is it? Well, I, I mean, I don't think we have a crisp definition for humans for machine reading comprehension. Like even, then, even now you can see the curriculum goes from really simple, you know, you know, grammatical Q and A, right, um, mm -hmm. all the way to, let's say, the LSAT test, which is way more complicated. Like you read a whole sentence, like mm -hmm. here are a couple of rules, and then you say, like, you know, does this or which of these sentences doesn't fit here? So I actually think there's um, a lot of complexity in in reading comprehension, which is why I'm personally very excited about the area. Yeah, we are, we also discussed the same uh, problem with uh, the Maruva team when they were here, right? Uh, we think there are at least uh, three aspects of uh, machine reading comprehension. First is the knowledge of representation. The second is the reasoning. And the third one is um, tricky. It's the common sense reasoning part. Uh, for example, in Pesilion's data set, there's an assumption that given the question, the answer must be a test span mm -hmm. in the text, mm -hmm. uh, given text. And this actually is a very strong assumption. And people are not doing that in the real life when they come up with answers. Sometimes I, I come up with answers without even reading the, uh, without even re read the document, read the, reading the document. Well, right. and, and something, yeah. Isabel, that you were mentioning, uh, maybe <coughs> the focus on multi-document yeah. um, is important because we glean our information from multiple sources and we use those <coughs> to confirm I guess maybe, does MS Marco, is that multi-document? Uh, it's just a step ahead, but Yeah, still, but it is multi-document. Yeah. It's multi-document, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, maybe I'll say something about like, what is the role of the data set, right? So, so I mm -hmm. think there's, there's, 
you know, we, we, there's a, basically a testing role and a training role, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I think we should distinguish. I think because once you put on your machine learning hat, those two, you're just thinking about data sets and you divide into train test. But I think um, for each of those parts, there's probably different things that you would want. For example, training, maybe you don't need clean data set. Maybe distance mm -hmm. supervision is a better way to do it. Also, from the training perspective, the role of a data set is actually to not necessarily be a driver of developing new methods, but it's a resource, just like you know, WarNet is a resource, or I guess in some sense ImageNet is a resource because you get information, and now this is generalizable to other settings. So maybe that's the way we should be thinking about you know, data sets for training, for example, the common sense stuff. Maybe we need to um, you know, d d uh, develop ways of kind of capturing you know, common sense mm -hmm. in a more targeted way in a, general, uh, in, a, um, in a way that can be used for a lot of other tasks. Um, and then on the evaluation side, it seems like um, you, know, you want actually many different types of evaluation metrics, maybe question generation, maybe um, yeah. you know, knowledge-based population, maybe you know, question answering of various forms. And um, I don't think there's necessarily should be one particular okay. you know, format for evaluation. Um, because if we're interested in anything general purpose, it should be able to do many things. And I, and I saw quite a recent <coughs> paper that basically is proposing a new method and testing it on these various tasks. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that is more along the lines of what you were what you're suggesting could be possible for evaluation, but that you have mm -hmm. a single model for the that captures the representation. And, uh, yeah. um, Actually, back to the speech task, actually the, the data set last, or which uh, lasts for 20 years is the speech recognition task. Yeah. It's very defined. It's not a speech understanding task. Yes. Uh, understanding is always tricky. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, what do you guys think about the proliferation of data sets? Is this going to, I mean, I see a proliferation of data sets. Um, if I look at the tasks available at Semival or at Connell, you know, we're getting an almost every paper, not every paper, but many papers introduce a new data set. Do we want to talk about whether that's good or bad or what we're learning from this as a field? I Isabel, do you want to <coughs> tackle that one? So um, I think it's both good and bad. Mm -hmm. so, so I always like it when um, papers that introduce new data sets evaluate on an old established data set that tackles a similar problem and then introduce a new data set and argues why this new data set is needed. Um, and I think, yeah, we, we will still get some more data sets, but uh, especially on, uh, for machine comprehension. But I think at some point the, the, the current trend will die down again, maybe mm -hmm. in, uh, in one or two years. Um, I'm not sure. I, th I think it's somewhat of a trend, really. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> there's always trends. Um, I think that there's just like a very large design space of things. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when you're building reading comprehension, should you have multiple choice? Should you have free form? Should you have spans? Or should you have some sort of, mm -hmm. you know, combination? You know, where do you pull your articles from? Should it be, f what's the role of knowledge graphs? Should it be multi-document paragraph? And I think uh, we don't know which one of these is, you know, these have various trade-offs. And I think it's actually good that these things can be explored in parallel by different, you know, researchers and, mm -hmm. you know, people can. But I think it's important for these data sets to be kind of open and kind of mm -hmm. accessible in a way that people can, you know, actually evaluate. And maybe as a community we should do a better job of, uh, you know, putting them in some sort of interfaces. Um, I know, I think Facebook has been doing a little bit of that with some of, um, some of these things, but, um, but I think it's at least for this period until we have mm -hmm. some clarity on what is, the, what is a good direction or several good directions, um, I think it's natural. And I think it's good that people are able to you know, create uh, data sets. Um, I mean, it does take money and some work, but it's it's feasible. Um, so, I, I overall think it's a good thing as well. So, um, going back to what we were talking about before, you know, if you really have true comprehen comprehension, you can have um, multiple. You, you can test it against multiple ways, like you said, multiple choice or 
uh, multiple tasks. So I think um, what's nice about having all these data sets is you can actually see, does my model work well against all of these? And, and maybe you could do some multitask learning. So the better you are across all these um, mm -hmm. data sets, the more I think we're moving in the right direction. So I think that part's good. Um, but of course, there's like a bad side, which is um, if there's too many data sets, we're a little un <coughs> uncoordinated. It might be kind of you know, spreading our ourselves thin. But I haven't seen that happen. It seems like um, there are network effects um, with these data sets. So once like a community sort of in a bottoms up way decides like this is this is the one we want, all want to work on for a while, they work on that until it gets exhausted. Then mm. they move to a different one. So now, although it's good, right? People are creating all sorts of different data sets to test different aspects of intelligence, right? Because intelligence itself is not verified. Uh, yeah. Then I, I don't worry too much about uh, uh, these data sets are not uh, uh, consistent or you need uh, additional effort to coordinate all these groups. I don't think it's necessary. As long as the data sets are open uh, to public, uh, it will figure it out. Uh, automatically. It, it does put a burden on somebody who's trying to publish. Um, for example, a student or, yeah. you know, it's like, oh, you know, you've, you've, you've reported results on Squad and MS Marco, but, you know, you didn't try my favorite mm -hmm. data set, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and I, That's I've hit that yeah. in reviewing. I, I think important the thing is that the, the reviewers also need to be open-minded. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I one yes. kind of call comment. to the reviewers <laughs> in the audience. Question. So, I mean, I guess maybe comparing kind of Squad and MS Marco, one of the reasons we focus on kind of the span mm -hmm. is just so that the inner annotator agreement could be high, yeah. yeah, yeah. which was, I think, uh, I think it was a good. You know, it's obviously mm -hmm. it you know leaves a lot off the table, but it was, I think, a, probably a good pragmatic decision. Yeah. Um, one of the challenges, I guess, I'm curious if you have thoughts on how to address is and when the answer can be some arbitrary sentence, how do you evaluate? Yeah, we do have problems. Yeah, yeah. yeah. currently we're using uh, uh, matching metrics such as blue and large. We know they are not perfect. Mm -hmm. And uh, internally we're also trying different uh, uh, metrics. We That's don't right. have the conclusion yet. I yeah, yeah. totally agree with okay. you. I think there's always a trade-off uh, uh, between how challenging or how realistic the task should be and how easy it can be evaluated. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like we've definitely spent since we since we launched the first version, we spent a lot of time on mm -hmm. uh, building you know, making the quality of the next version better. And um, we are pretty happy with the progress. So I think when we we'll have another kind of refresh of it mm -hmm. soon, which will be bigger and ho hopefully higher quality, but it's you know it is it is complicated when you have a human generated answer versus yeah. span. How many uh, reference uh, answers do you have? We question? try to create uh, multiple reference. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's expensive and time consuming. Mm -hmm. right. And so, yeah. Isabel, for your scientific summarization, mm -hmm. you also have oh, you're using the single uh, summary as given by the author. Yes. Do you have multiple references also? No, it's just one. Uh, one set of highlights per paper. Right. So, and that's the author's perspective, that's the author's at perspective. that moment in time. Exactly. So, yes. I think that's that's going to be a challenge mm -hmm. going forward. With you know, that that there are also multiple perspectives on you know what counts as a summary. Mm -hmm. um, on yeah, sometimes yeah that's actually the the biggest challenge with. Um, so, most of the, for these generating answers, we we evaluate on these. Uh, metrics similar to, that's been really well in translation, like rouge and, and blue, mm -hmm. but the problem is um, you can write a semantically similar answer that's correct, but have very little overlap, mm -hmm. right? And that's one of the challenges that, that we are facing, actually. So I think, along with data sets, uh, metrics is, a, is another area that people should focus on, like, especially around summarization. How do we create a great metric to, to measure summarization? So one recent work is about uh, trendy Task generation task into a ranking task when you do some, uh, when you do evaluation. Mm -hmm. uh, I just give you one good summary and uh, three bad summary to see if your model can differentiate the good one uh, versus bad ones. I mean, this is often how people view a knowledge-based population as a ranking yeah. task. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. But you only do it in in the evaluation time. Yes. Yeah. Mm, that's yeah. I guess I mean you can start bringing humans into the loop. 
for this. Oh, that's expensive. <laughs> but but I think there are ways. I mean, we've been thinking about um, using humans to uh, evaluate some part of it, but uh -huh. you can also train kind of uh, evaluators that mm. can oh, and yeah, start caching. The, the, that's know. a lot of uh, discussing on how to <coughs> generate a, a, you know automatic metric yeah. by learning yeah. a model um, based on human data. Yeah. But it can. There's a whole continuum between having yeah. humans evaluate every single one and having. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True. Yeah, so yeah absolutely. Yeah. So I, I mean, think that some, could be interesting. There's something to in the explore. middle that works. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah our concern with having an automatic evaluator is like it'll have some bias, yeah. right? And and then you, you know is your model learning the the bias or is it learning the problem, solving yeah. the problem? Yeah. I mean, I think you just need a metric that's faithful enough to human evaluations mm -hmm. to serve mm -hmm. as kind of a signal to hill climb or evaluate yeah. and understand. Well, it doesn't yeah. have to be. So you, you know. we, we ran into trouble yeah. with that in summarization yeah. because yeah. Right. nobody in the end believed it. Even though it was <laughs> demonstrated to correlate with human judgment, yeah. um, it, it, nobody ever really believed it. Somehow blue has stuck, but rouge kind yeah. of is in disfavor and never was quite sure why that was because yeah. in principle they're rather the same. And actually, I could give you a real example. So with SNET, which is the work by MSRA, which is, um, so RNET was you know, trying to find the span. So SNET is, let me try and synthesize an answer. And uh, it actually got better root scores than um, RNET on MS Marco. But then when you actually read some of the sentences, they're, they're just like, <laughs> you know, they're not fluid, right? <laughs> no. So it's, it's like, it's not just getting the answer right. It needs to also be legible, I guess, is the. I just want to make sure that people know if you have a question, please raise your hand and one of the mics will come to you if you want to join in this discussion. Otherwise, I have a whole bunch of questions and we're, we're going to keep going. But please join if you want. Because one of my questions now is, what is going to be the role of explanation? Um, that was kind of part of our discussion when we put up the abstract um, for this uh, session. and. Maybe hints hints of it have come from the various talks that, that we need. And, you know, what is what is going to be? How is the computer, even if they, it does understand, how is it going to communicate its understanding? How is it going to explain why it gave a particular answer? And is that mm -hmm. part of our role? And I don't think right now we've done a good job of evaluating that. Yeah, well, I think uh, and when uh, people. Um, sometimes people are not happy with neural network models because they view neural network models as black boxes. You generate answers without uh, explaining why you generate answers like that. But when we talk about model interpretation, I think we need to um, make it very clear what the interpretation for. What is you know, for? I think there are two reasons. One is to debug the system. The other is to provide the explanation to the users of the model to convince the user that you should trust the model. I think trust is a very big yeah. concern. For example, we've right? been working on some, some prediction engine for sales marketing, right? And we said, OK, you should call this uh, customer uh, today. And without uh, uh, providing explanations or reasons, then no salesperson is going to follow your recommendation. Mm -hmm. right? it's, it's, it's crucial. But it's still open research problem. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. The question is then, what are good explanations? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I yeah. think this is this is really really hard. And again, we would need some human in the loop kind of setup, which is very costly. So I think maybe that's why not so many people are working on it. Yeah. I mean, you could see just uh, uh, explanation as just one additional auxiliary task where you just generate an explanation in addition to your other, you know, your, your other main task. And mm, yeah. yeah. But that really, you need some, you know, <laughs> you need some feedback. Otherwise, you can't really learn mm -hmm. that. Okay. Okay. Explanation seems to be compelling. Explanation, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, so maybe Can you introduce yourself. Sorry. Oh, um, my name is Yejin uh, at University of Washington. So um, I have a question about the modeling choices. So in the recent year, uh, sick to sick model has been the way to go for. A uh, number of different tasks like machine reading, but also question answering and summarization, anything you name it, like machine translation, image captioning, uh, just convert that into a sick to sick 
model, and it feels like it principled in the sense the intermediate representation just comes from the data and it's end-to-end uh, -end training, which just feels right. Except there's something strange about um, how for, for example, machine reading, um, it requires like, uh, I forgot the degree, of, um, the scale of the data set, but like, for example, squad data set is huge, but focusing on like 500 documents mostly, and humans never really have to solve that many QA questions in order to really understand the new document. And we know that if we give a, like a random Wikipedia document, then probably the end-to-end -end models will not be able to really understand what it is if the domain is different. So then, um, just a it, clarification: the training yes. and test documents are different. And so, uh, yeah, so. it is different, but it's maybe uh, similar in nature. So if you cannot suddenly <laughs> give a novel, for example, uh, sure. and novels. ask, yeah. So, so there's that. something strange about the, the setup, and also sentence uh, uh, summarization uh, requires like one point more than one million, I think, um, sentence pairs, and it achieves the state of the art, but if we try to summarize a new sentence out of new domain, then probably it's not going to do as well. And it seems a little bit weird to me that there's this thing called the language models, which um, probably learns something about the language, but it's not necessarily being used in uh, some of these other task settings and whereas humans, we just learn language and then we are able to do a lot of these operations without having to try to compress a million sentence pairs, for example. So I'm wondering if um, the panel might have some speculations about these modeling choices, where end, whether end-to-end -end models will be able to really push the limit somehow if we can come up with a new architecture, or um, might there be an entirely new approach that we should be thinking about? Sorry for the long question. I, I'll, I'll leave it to you guys. I think it's a, it, a little bit kind of maybe the proliferation of data sets supports what Yijin is asking about because there are so many things. But, but I'll leave it. What are the modeling choices that you're making? Uh, it really depends on your goal. If I, I, I have a very specific task in mind, uh, that's my goal, then I would definitely try end-to-end -end learning if I got the train data, because this is the only way to get the optimal solution, given the data and the given the task. But if we are talking about the general artificial intelligence, okay, we want to learn some representation which is universal, universally useful for all sorts of tasks, then uh, recent work on multitask learning might be a better choice. So you, you figure out um, multiple tasks, then try to learn uh, uh, sort of universal representation, which can encode a language in a way that it supports different tasks. Then we can imagine that the more tasks uh, you can support, the more universal the representation could be. Actually, human tries to understand the, the, the language more like a multitask learning. Uh, but uh, again, it's depending on, on, on your on your output goal. Yeah, I I would say that the CCC kind of pair or attention based paradigm, I think is uh, I mean it's a tool. Um, it is certainly the case that I think uh, because of these you know benchmarks, people focus on these tasks, mm -hmm. and there's kind of very um, a lot of, kind of specialization. Um, um, but I think the um, if you wanted, I guess to there, I think in my mind there's still a long, a big gap between kind of these reading comprehension data sets and kind of a, a model which is a kind of a world model that you can you know the agent has that um, you can use to kind of reason at a very high level with. I think abstraction is still something that's kind of missing. I mean, mm -hmm. there's basically paraphrase and kind of, you know, oh, this entity looks like this entity, and it's very still close. I think it's, um, you know, if you think about kind of IR as the bottom layer, okay, you're just matching keywords. Now we're matching kind of fuzzed up uh, mm -hmm. kind of concepts, but um, it's not clear what the 
at least to me, what the path to is to have, you know, I guess, you know, truly abstract concepts that allow you to think about the world and not in terms of text. Because I think, you know, a lot of our understanding is not mm -hmm. based on, you know, a textual representation, but something much more abstract. Yeah, one of the most interesting parts of our question was um, the way humans learn and the way machines learn are very different. Like machines have to get tons and tons of this data, either labeled or, or semi-supervised, while humans um, seem, for some reason, it seems like we don't need that much data, right? And um, an example of that uh, that I ran into, like, um, that sticks with me is one of my friends has a two-year-old. And um, when he first saw a dog, you know, he's like, you know, his dad said, that's a dog. And then as soon as he saw that, he would walk around. And every time he saw a dog, he'd be like, that's a dog, that's a dog, right? And I'm like, oh, that's an example of one-shot learning. You know, from one example, he just like learned this concept of a dog. And uh, that's something that humans can do that I think is really fascinating. And even better is, is zero-shot learning. Like you read a description of a cat, and then you're like, that's a cat, right? Um, I think that's, that's really unique. And this is why it's important for us to work on these problems. Like once we, you know, I think it's going to take us a long time to, to understand like what is the difference between humans and machines and how do we get them to do that. Um, but I think, you know, working on, on these comprehension problems will help us really understand intelligence and, and get us there. I mean, another thing that people have worked on quite a bit is multimodal learning. So mm -hmm. also based on the idea that humans learn not only from text, but also from speech, from, from vision, from what they see, maybe even from what they feel. Um, um, I don't know, is, is this the way forward, really? I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really interesting. But if you think about uh, training a model in this way and then also training it to work for lots and lots of domains, then at some point it really becomes infeasible in practice. No. So I guess, uh, yeah, I guess my question would be, even if you took all the tasks um, and you trained one giant model, do you get a kind of a more abstract representation that is closer to this thing that we've been kind of in pursuit of? Or do you just get kind of some sort of union or intersection representation? And no one knows. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, that's definitely one of our, our bets. Yeah. Like, we're, we're trying to see, like, you're trying to build this one multitask model mm -hmm. with a lot of NLP um, Task. you know, tasks, yeah. right? And yeah. we're seeing, you know, how does it do? And one of the interesting things that does come out of it is um, it does get easier to learn the next NLP task. So I think that part's interesting, but still there's a and, lot and of unknowns. One things. thing I'll point out just from perspective of history is that I strongly believe that the continuous models are the way to go. Because that is, you shall know the wor uh, you know, a word by the company it keeps. It, it's not that cat kind of all of a sudden drops off and from cat to not cat. You know, there's, there's a sliding scale between mm what you call one thing and then yeah, yeah. It, it, it's the tiger not cat. discreet, right? It's very, and we always knew that. And yeah. that's the principle of a dictionary mm -hmm. because a dictionary of a, the definition of a swallow will be, it'll be a bird that swoops and catches flies. And the definition of a penguin is a bird that catches fish underwater and swims. So, so you can see that all of our concepts are in fact <coughs> continuous and it just, keeps going you know water is itself a continuous so i think the continuous models are the thing that is most exciting mm -hmm. to me and then how you put that together and, and do the inference over them you know those are things that you guys are struggling with but i think mm -hmm. that the continuous models will stay now to push sorry to push that further i guess how much continuous uh how much watery do you want things to be because there's there's still an i mean it seems like there's an intuitive notion of entities. Um, on the other hand, entities are also not clear. Like there's objects uh, in the, it's a kind of a useful abstraction to have. Yes. Um, but object identity is also not clear, so. Um, right, and it's very temporal, right? Yeah, Who is the president of France? Today, one <laughs> person, tomorrow, the next person. I'm specifically picking a different country. So, um, you know, those are very temporal, but we have so many different ways of modifying our concepts. So even an entity, mm -hmm. I'm here in, as a working person, but, you know, I'm a soccer mom as well. And I have, we all wear many hats, even the physical entity wears many hats. 
So I think that's kind of interesting too. Modification is very important part of our language, mm -hmm. um, and acknowledging that in our models, I think, is 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 very important. Somehow, language is still discrete. The but I don't itself. think so. I think no, our expression of what we have in our mind is necessarily discrete. But I think yeah, the expression. That's what the I meant. expression the, is. Just, yeah, just the concepts are right. more fluid. But mm -hmm. for whatever reason, uh, evolution has decided that. And and, and our um, language itself is a summary of what we have in our mind, mm -hmm. um, and the complexity of what we're trying to communicate. Uh, so one last okay. question. Sorry, I'm going to pick from this side. Uh, thank you for uh, this is Mossum from IIT Delhi. Thank you for the very engaging uh, conversation. I, I was thinking the transition of um, machine reading as it has happened over the last maybe five or eight years. The the earlier generation of question answering systems were very knowledge base centric and uh, very inference centric. So can you answer questions using inference over knowledge base? This is my proof chain. This is my uh, final answer. And the current version of question answering is very. Um, uh, sort of surface form uh, machine comprehension uh, centric uh, knowledge bases have sort of gone into oblivion uh, inference is sort of not being explicit i was wondering uh, if it's uh, what what is your opinion about this particular change do you think it's particularly good change do you think knowledge bases may come back do you think um, uh, uh, with there is inference going on it's just going on neurally that we don't quite see it i mean uh, what do you think about this uh, specific transition so I think there's still uh, there's still room for knowledge bases, and there are people working on the intersection of knowledge bases and, and neural methods. So, for example, at, at UCL where I worked uh, previously, uh, lots of people worked on the idea of injecting no background knowledge from knowledge bases into a neural model, um, which is which is really really interesting, and it's a way of, of doing, I guess, transfer learning from a from a knowledge base. So I think that still has a is a good thing yeah. to study. Actually, we are working on both. Uh, uh, for example, uh, we have this knowledge graph called uh, Satori. Satori. Right. Satori is a knowledge, uh, knowledge, uh, big knowledge graph. Right. We try to encode the Satori information using neural network models, um, using the approach I just described. Right. Then remember, if you remember the reason that has a long-term memory case, then you can encode the entire knowledge graph in the, in the long-term memory by uh, trying to answer questions uh, and uh, uh, try to generate answers from the knowledge graph uh, to a question. Yeah, I think part so, of this is the, is the trend we were talking about earlier. Like, mm -hmm. in, like knowledge bases were um, the most interesting knowledge representation at the time. Now we have these uh, continuous representations. Because we saw these, the knowledge bases weren't working. Like, as Lucy said, a lot of concepts are are fluid and, and continuous. So now that we have this new continuous representation uh, of knowledge, like what can we do with it? And I think that's why we're looking at more of these these text type systems. So it's I guess interesting. The thing that's kind of appealing about knowledge bases is that they give you kind of abstractions that allow you to do aggregation much more easily mm -hmm. than with text. But of course, having worked on knowledge bases, you recognize how incomplete and how how it's always fitting a square peg into a round hole. Mm -hmm. And um, what would be, I think, interesting is to embrace the, the kind of the, um, kind of, uh, I don't know, the holistic aspect of knowledge bases, but in a more kind of modern neural way. So, I mean, it has always been kind of the traditional paradigm. If you were using knowledge bases, you have to do extraction, populate the knowledge base, and then you do QA. But um, what if you thought about the process as, OK, I'm going to go over um, Wikipedia or ClueWeb or whatever you have access to and build mm -hmm. some sort of kind of memory store that's um, not uh, anchored on the, the documents. And now, given that, you have to support all of question mm -hmm. answering. Maybe that would be a kind of a forcing function that um, would allow you to kind of learn the, the kind of knowledge base like things, but more in a in a fluid way, mm -hmm. um, and hopefully the QA would be enough pressure that you didn't, you know, forget too much. Mm -hmm. right. Keeping, in, yeah, and, and keeping in mind that the establishing the trust in the answer yeah. or the well, understanding that's, that's given is, I think, a very important part in our human-computer interaction. It's to establish that trust. How do you know that 
from where do you know that? Um, yeah, I was going to. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. I was going to actually say something about that earlier about the trust. It seems like there's several levels here. Kind of one of them is you can think about precision and one is recall, right? So, you know, we trust search engines because uh, they give you, you know, it, and if it gets answers, you can get the provenance, mm -hmm. you can look at the mm -hmm. web page and True. so on. But on the, the recall aspect, it seems like a very hard problem. How do I know that if I, this is the, you know, the full truth in some sense and not something that hasn't been mm -hmm. hidden. And as more kind of complementary or contradictory information gets mm -hmm. chosen, you can basically give provenance to like anything right. basically. That's, that's why I, I like yeah. the um, rumor yeah. eval that, that Isabel is, you know, working on. And I think those will be very important kind of going forward. So, yeah. But yeah. speaking of uh, search engines, it's also a personalization problem. Mm -hmm. So, so someone else's person, someone else's truth might not be your truth for an mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. for a query. Yeah. Okay, but it is truth that it is now past twelve thirty, <laughs> and you guys definitely thank you very much. And I think we need to have lunch, all of us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks.